Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome on the stage Paul, Steve Hanley and Kevin Cummins. Round of applause. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Welcome to the uh, Old Brother podcast, which we don't normally do live, but we've been invited to be here before. And what before, yeah. yeah. Oh, it's loud the words. Are we uh, <coughs> allowed to do this, are we? Well, I think, I think we're, still, well, we're going to make the best of it, but well, for the next hour, we're still allowed to talk about the fall. I'm not sure when the call. <laughs> no, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> Can I going to serve it at one point. You're not allowed to make it, you have to put that right, I think there. it's because it's a Sunday, we're all right. Oh, of course, yeah. yeah. So I was going to introduce this gentleman here, but obviously I don't need to introduce him to you because you've all bought a ticket, so it'd be a bit weird if he didn't know who he was, wouldn't it? But for the purpose Someone of... asked me directions to her outside the bus station, he didn't know who I was. Uh, that's, that's the, uh, that's so, the being so behind the camera, that's something in the wrong way. <laughs> Well, uh, for the purposes of the tape, with our guest today is the marvellous Mr. Kevin Cummins. Um, by way of introduction, if you've ever seen a picture of Joy Division, it was probably taken by Kevin, I think. I don't. So if, if, you, if you weren't lucky enough to be going to gigs in Manchester in 1979, and you've got an image of Joy Division, then Kevin probably took the picture. I think that's fair to say, don't you, Kevin? Fair to say. Yeah, I think so. But uh, I was taking pictures of other people. Oh yeah, well, we're going to get onto one of them in a moment. Then. So uh, the, the reason he's on the old four, the, the old brother podcast, the old fall podcast, <laughs> the old fall brother cast, um, <laughs> is because of this marvelous tomb we have in front of us, which is a collection of his uh, works over the years, taking pictures of the fall, and one of the joys of this book is you know, you know unfortunately with Joy Division it's quite a short period this, this is quite it's quite a journey this one yeah, yeah it is actually I mean you, you know you kind of see 40 years of Mark running yeah. through it um, and really you know it's it's kind of my story alongside theirs and his and yours and whoever else was there plenty of you but um, somebody reviewed it on Amazon and said, it's all right, this book, but it's got a lot of gaps in it. And it's like, well, you know, I didn't live with him. <laughs> There's not that many gaps, to be I fair. I wouldn't be alive if I did this, <laughs> you No, know, there aren't. I mean, it's just whenever I dig it yeah. out of his life, you know. He does know how taking photographs of bands work. So, no, yeah, no, I do, no, I do. <laughs> you get slagged off usually on Amazon for the packaging being awful. <laughs> <laughs> One star. Shit. One star. Oh, oh. Shit, mate, the packaging fell apart. <laughs> <laughs> right, we're going to go back. That's a bold lyric, if in case you weren't there. So, one of the cliches that gets trotted out, probably by me as much as anybody else, is that that got Manchester Music started at that Sex Pistols gig in 1976. But you were taking, I mean, I don't know how much you were actually earning, but you were taking professional photography way before that, weren't you? Well, I graduated that year. So, um, whenever I took any pictures of a band, if I started working for the enemy probably May, June 77. Right. You know, kind of bombarded them with information. False and true. <laughs> mainly false, actually. You know, and um, whenever I did a job for the enemy, it would be probably cost me twenty quid in film and processing and a couple of prints. I got six pound fifty for it. Oh, well. So I wasn't sure it was going to be something I'd do for a long time. I thought maybe I'd do it till I got a proper job. Yeah, it was expensive business, then, wasn't it? It yeah. was, yeah. yeah. And well, I'm thinking of that picture, like, there's a picture of, of you, you took a David Bowie and that was 73? Yeah, yeah, I did that at, my, at art school, mainly so I could black it into the gig, to be honest. Well, like, that's how you made your yeah. money, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, I got him free. Yeah, yeah, I didn't have to pay to go to most gigs, so that was okay. Yeah? Um, but the Bowie one I took when I was 19, and because um, I was obsessed with Bowie, yeah. and I kind of, I just thought, um, walking with a college camera case and they'll just let me in and they didn't really have backstage passes or anything then so I just used to, sometimes I'd take the case to a gig uh, so I could stand on it really <laughs> and, uh, and then after going to about three gigs I thought it's quite good I'll put a camera in it and yeah. maybe take some pictures there so I, so I took some of Bowie. Where was um, that? What venue was that? Uh, Free Trade Hall. Well, I went to the Hard Rock in 72 at Christmas. Oh, I just missed that. Yeah, yeah which was great. And I, I took three photographs there because I was trying out. 
a colour film. We, we were given a, some projects over Christmas to do. So I took some pictures of Bowie on this really grainy kind of fashion colour film. Um, GAF 500 for all you in, interested folk out there. And um, you had to send it off to Germany. It took about three weeks to come back and then it was shit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so then, you know. You know. Um, and we did loads of different things on it just to try it out under different conditions. So I took three pictures of Bowie, which are kind of okay. And then I took some pictures of Bowie at Free Trade Hall and then we went to Leeds as well. That, Ziggy Stardust still had insane so wow. and took some there. And that's when and the BA bought the picture from me. Well, and so it was like my first sale ever to a gallery and I thought, you know, maybe it is quite a good way to do it. And when I say they bought it off me, they said, Would you like to donate it? Well, yeah, yeah. Well, it sounds better if you say yeah, you yeah, yeah, yeah. bought it from me. Well, I don't wish to cast aspersions on whoever was teaching your college, but that photograph is as good a photograph as you've ever got. So I don't think you, you did can't have learned you can't have had much to learn. Because that's that's a fantastic one. Yeah, I mean, you still learn. I mean, I'm you know that's not being you know false modest or anything. I think you st you learn all the time by looking at all the work and looking how you can make a better picture. And I took a picture at the Free Trade Hall of Bowie, and I thought it I wasn't in the quite right position for the shot I wanted. So when I went to Leeds, I stood in that position and waited for that moment where it yeah. was the mind to width of a circle. And I got the shot I wanted. Yeah. Um, and you kind of have to do that. You have to research your subject a little bit, maybe. Yeah. You can't just wing it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot, a lot of the time. You know. <laughs> so, um, so what research did you do for the fall? Well, I'd, I'd been to the gig. So I knew, I knew exactly where I wanted to stand to get a better picture. Okay. So then I just stood there at the lead show, which was only half full actually, because yeah. it had been cancelled from earlier in the tour. They were due to play Leeds University and the stage was too small. So they played this venue, Leeds Roll Arena, which didn't really have gigs and it didn't sell out. So we were able to just wander about and I stood in exactly the spot I thought might make the picture better and took it. So what, when was the first time you took the fall then? Was that when um, probably that gig at St George's um, uh, Youth Club in right. like Collyhurst. They played, played uh, we put the ticket up actually and um, it was 50 pence. Nobody bought one so they changed it to 20 pence. <laughs> hastily crossed out and written on 20 pence in Biro. Um, and after about three songs, the guy, it was a youth club, and the guy who ran the youth club came over to him and said, it's not quite what we were expecting. <laughs> <laughs> kind of the story of Mark's life, to be fair. <laughs> um, and he said, you're a bit loud, and it's not really the right kind of music. So he told them to pack up, really. And whoever was managing or looking after him rang uh, the squat, um, what squat? Um, ranch. The, ranch, the ranch. Club, yeah. And said, can we finish our gig there? So they said, yeah, come down. And so they went down to this place about a mile away, which was a punk club, really, but rarely had, I mean, they had bands on, but it was like, <laughs> It wasn't even like a tenth of the size of this. It was quite a small place. Um, and Mark being Mark didn't play the first three numbers again. He just carried on the game. So <laughs> Sorry, a, little break, a break in proceedings. He wasn't giving them extra for their 20 pence. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that picture from the ranch is quite... Quite unusual because it's everybody, isn't it? That's yeah, a, it's in the book, obviously. Yeah, I had a, I had a very wide-angle lens that I like to use, and so you could. You, I was probably about. 18 inches, two feet away from them, but it was very wide, so I managed to get a whole band shot. It's a brilliant, brilliant photograph. Yeah, you kind of get the feel for the excitement of yes. being there, I think. Yeah, yeah. Although I did a wider shot, and you can see the audience, they're not remotely excited. <laughs> <laughs> I was. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, they were a good-looking bunch, though, weren't they? Well, they were, maybe not, you know, not in the classical sort of thing, but it was a good-looking band. Yeah, I thought so. I yeah, thought, yeah. you know, they, all, uh, they, were, they were a very strong-looking band, definitely. Yeah, yeah. And he didn't want to be anything, you know... That was, like, the first shot at the Collyhurst thing. Right. Mark with his Rock Against Racism band. Yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Quite right. Every so time. The, the, when you say the Collyhurst, that's the youth club. That's the youth club, yeah, right. yeah, and then these are the ranch. These are the ranch. That's brilliant, that. I mean, that, you know... 
They look like a proper rock band there, don't they? They do, they do. Yeah. They have to fight the third when, kick. When, it was the third kick. Well, it was, it was like either the second and the third kick or third and fourth, wasn't it? Yeah. Although you count it as one. I think. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Same kick. Yeah. yeah. But they weren't quite, they didn't look quite so glamorous the next shot, which was in the flat. Oh, yeah, well, um, we did the shoot when. Um, <laughs> for sounds, I think it was, or maybe anime, I can't remember, but around Christmas. And Mark, we don't, never, I never wanted to shoot traditional rock and roll pictures particularly, and Mark certainly didn't. And at the time, Man City were running this series of features in the programme of players at home with their lovely wives and lovely children and lovely house and lovely car and all this. And Mark said, why don't we do it like that? And I said, well, you know, Dennis Stewart's leafy mansion in Cheshire oh, yeah. is not, it's a bit like different to your flat in Presswich. Um, and he said, yeah, but it'd be fun. And of course, you know, the, you present a magazine with a picture like that with no idea. It don't look fun, to be fair. No, it wasn't. <laughs> no, and he, he made some attempts at tidying up by shoving about a week's washing up under the sofa. <laughs> um, and there was a fair, you know, a few political posters on the wall and various bits and pieces. And uh, I said, shall we do a picture outside as well? So we did the picture by Presswich Hospital. And it was only when I was processing the pictures that I realised Mark was holding a cat. I've yeah. you know, no idea where he got it from. I didn't even know if it was his. Oh, right. <laughs> Did he bring it with him? <laughs> no idea. So, but it was dark, you know, and I was having to do this shoot with Flash outside about eight o'clock at night. And um, well, like I say, when I processed the pictures, I thought, oh, God, he's got a cat, you know. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting now because... That, you, you, you've talked about it before in the context of Joy Division about your photographs kind of shape the image of the band. I think that's really true, John. Mm. You know I mean, I, 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 if you've ever met any of Joy Division, they, they, they were, certainly weren't the, you know, the young men, dour kind of guys. They weren't at all, no, and everybody, that was how we wanted them to appear, and that was how Tony Wilson wanted them to look like, Rob wanted them to look like, and they were really intimidating. And Rob said, the reason he never wanted them to do interviews is because they were all really stupid. And, <laughs> and uh, they'll just say fucking stupid things, you know. So he said, it's better to be enigmatic. Yeah, yeah. And then, so I never took a picture of them smiling. I didn't do anything like that. Everything was really kind of Eastern European yeah. serious. In fact, one of the pictures from the bridge, looking back into Manchester, when I've done interviews in Europe, people say, is that Dresden or is it Poznan? And then I said, no, it's actually Manchester. Yeah. That's, what, that's what it was like. Yeah. And they're, they're kind of horrified because they have this idea that England's great. Yeah, know? yeah. I mean, it was, a, it was a good place, Manchester then, wasn't it? Yeah, it was, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, that Hollyhurst youth club was quite near the Electric Circus, which was a big punk venue. And I used to drive there because I had all my camera gear and it was a bit, it was a bit dangerous. Yeah, yeah. Mm. And um, we'd meet up in the ranch after a gig and half the people who'd been at the gig were like ripped clothes, um, black wasn't, eyes, caught everything. It was like a mile back in yeah, town. People, yeah. They used to get ambushed all the time and I'd be just driving around not having a clue that any of this was going on. <laughs> you had to walk from town, didn't you? I only went to the electric circus once. Yeah, but it was. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah. definitely. And it was. It, there was a lot of kids there um, threatening to mind your car. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, a bit, it's a bit of a poor show. We talk about Manchester and how central music was it. It's a bit poor show that the Premier Punk venue was a mile outside the city centre in Collier. So it's a bit crazy. Yeah, it was. I mean, it wasn't because it was such a nice place either. The venue it was a shithole. By oh, that. completely. I mean, you, you wouldn't get away with it now, would you? No, no. no nowhere like that would be allowed to open. No, I always thought that about... There was a few, weren't there, the Mayflower. They were that, all like that. That was 100 fair. years late being condemned, that, yeah. the Mayflower. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> terrible. But most venues here, most venues in Manchester were like that. Yeah, they? yeah. They were terrible. I mean, speaking of terrible places, you famously took pictures of Joy Division and the Fall 
in TJ Davidson's. Yeah. Now that was, I mean, that made the yeah, that made it circus look like bloody rich, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that the was the hotel actually. Yeah, 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 not not the rich ball. Not the rich yeah. venue, no, yeah, no, no, yeah. Which was just as bad as the others. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, when you look at the Joy Division pictures of them in the rehearsal room, you'll see you know, a lot of coke cans and fancy cans around, and they're all full of piss because yeah. none of them could be bothered going to the floor below to use the toilets, which were usually blocked anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the bloke who owned it, Tony Davis, and that no interest in ever getting them repaired. <laughs> well, what, if he was if he was, if he was writing a list of repairs for that building, I think yeah. the toilets would be fair. The, the, <laughs> making sure the floors weren't condemned. Yeah, yeah, the whole thing. I mean, terrible. not to say how bad it was. The caretaker was a tramp he found sleeping. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's, there's another picture I took of them, and underneath the light fitting, there's um, a Mac Fisheries. A uh, plastic bag hanging from the ceiling, and it was to catch the water before it hit the electric light. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not that there was much electrical equipment in there. Amazing repair for that yeah. place, wasn't it? No, it's good. <laughs> but I mean, they, they are amazing. Those photographs, the ones of the fall and the ones of yeah. Joy. It's a yeah. great room to take a photograph in. It was great. It's interesting how different the bands look. I also photographed a band in there called Alien Tints. If anyone remembers them. <laughs> but I've never really. Not... Left. Those pictures haven't really flown out. <laughs> When's that book coming out? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thinner volume. When I've exhausted all of the rest of it, I might do a Tony Davidson, TJ Davidson's book. Oh, yeah, you'll have to pay him. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> he did a book, didn't he, last year or the year before? He did, yeah. Yeah. Have you read it? No, he sent me a copy. He said, I've used your picture on the cover. And he said, oh, great. Um, you're going to send me some money. And he said, it's a picture of me. I don't have to pay, do I? <laughs> That's how it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you settled out of court? Uh, yeah, well, yeah, he's, he's kind of connected, though, isn't he? I think. Well, you'd like to think so. Yeah, think him, and, him and Ray Rossi and Mike be. Rossi from Slaughter and the Dogs. Well, so I mean, all kind of... He must of... be getting on a bit now, then. He looks well. Have you seen pictures of him? He looks about 35. I don't know what he's I don't know if he's had his blood trapped or something, but yeah. I, the picture of him was a picture of him sat in on a Lotus Elite in Manchester. Oh. I, I was never sure whether it was his or not. <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. So, I was going to ask you, and you've said it again about Joy Division, about you felt the responsibility to present them in the best way. Did you feel the same about the fall, or was they, were they kind of more... I don't think I was ever allowed to impose my will on the fall, yeah. to be honest. Um, well, photographing the fall was always very different, because... But Mark actually did like having his photograph taken. He was very um, good at it as well. Yeah, he, liked, he did like it, but he didn't like to do it straight away. So whenever you'd go and meet up to do a session, it was like every time I photographed the fall, it pretty much would be a different lineup. And I always say it was a bit like going around to see your friend's house and he's got a new wife and kids. And there was he had not absolutely true. he never introduced them to you. You have absolutely <laughs> no idea who these people well, that'd be true, yeah. And then I didn't even to the band, you know, someone else would just be there. And he would um, we, you know, he'd sometimes bring one member out for a photo session, sometimes just turn up on his own. He always knew whether we needed just him or the band, but it didn't matter. And then he'd say, oh, let's go and have a pint and have a chat about Man City or this, that, and what have you been doing? Tech piss for half an hour. <laughs> Five pints later, it's too late to do pictures, so you have to go back the next day. <laughs> <laughs> and that was pretty much the story of the fall every time I photographed him. You know, he wouldn't tell me yes. where the venue was, he wouldn't be there if he did tell me. It'd be like, you'd always try and have to work it out to, that you'd go to the nearest pub close to where he told you to meet up and up to on he was there. Didn't you do that abroad a few times with you? Yeah, he did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Berlin. Berlin. Yeah. <laughs> Although, to be fair, he, he kind of fell out with the band on the way there as well, didn't he? So, oh, OK. He, he had a, he, he, we were going to Berlin and they were playing a gig there and I always wanted to photograph him in Berlin and I flew there direct and they didn't turn up for ages. And then, he, this is like 2006, 2007, and I bumped into Steve Trafford that afternoon, and, he, and I said, what's happening? Are you going down to the vet? And he said, oh, don't even ask. He said, it's a fucking nightmare. He said, first of all, Mark tried to smoke on the plane, <laughs> and he got told that you haven't been 
man smoking a plane for 10 years, but that didn't <laughs> seem to notice that. Um, well, then that's what you used to then, say was, well, what are they going to do, throw me off? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Don't I'll arrest you when you actually yeah, land. absolutely. <laughs> and then, he, then we went to, then he said he got to Frankfurt and, uh, Airport to change flights, so he wanted to smoke there and he wouldn't let him smoke there. Then when he finally landed and got in, in a cab, he lit up and the taxi driver said, no smoking in my cab. And he said, I fucking smoke where I like. And he said, not in my cab. And he turned around and grabbed the cigarette out of Mark's mouth. So Mark punched him. And all this happened at the traffic light. And coincidentally, there was a news team at the traffic lights making a news story. So there's a camera presenter and they're just looking at his cab rocking behind. <laughs> And so they turned the camera on it and filmed it all and then said to the cab driver, if you need that, we've got it. You know, we kind of saw him assault you. Um, and so the tour manager had to give him some money to shut up. Um, he got to, the, got to the hotel, took his false teeth out and slammed them on the, on the bedside table where he bounced off and while he's looking for him, he stood on them. <laughs> And so, and then he just said, another, just another day. <laughs> then he said to Eleni, you're going to have to go out and get these fixed because you speak German. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that, I was the gig. <laughs> you don't go that far. And, uh, well, the gig was great, and then he wouldn't do any pitch. He, he would only do pitch across the road from the gig. So it was like, we'd come all the way to Berlin, and, and you know what, pitch looks like we took it on Salford Precinct. <laughs> <laughs> and he, that was a, a kind of... That, but like you say, that was a fairly typical day. Yeah, but I mean, the, the thing about all that is, you end up with great shots at the end of it, don't you? Do, you do, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. they're like, oh, that's all right then. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's all, well, that's all I'm there for. I'm, yeah, not, yeah. I'm not, you know, I'm not, no, no, that's right, yeah. not a family counsellor, am I? No. <laughs> Wait, why should Charlotte sign? Because for all that, and for all it looked like he was mucking you about and all that, he, he, did, he was quite invested in the mythology of the photographs. Yeah, of course he was. He, yeah. he, understood, he understood it. He understood what pictures would do for them. There are some bands who don't understand it at all. And some, you know, like the Fall Day, Manic Street Preachers did. You know, they always yeah. really understood what, how strong the rock press was and what it would do for them and how you had to work at, you know, you didn't just turn up and say, well, what's your idea? Um, for their first enemy cover that I did, uh, they went out the night before and asked girls in a nightclub to give them love bites so they'd look really trashy the following day. This is a lot of big pictures, look yeah. before, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's clear, yeah, that's not the fall. Yeah. Um, so they were, you know, so they all had these bruises on their necks and look dead trashy, it was great, you know, yeah. that's what you want, you want a band to understand how you help to build rock and roll mythology and I think it's harder now because a lot of bands take their own pictures, yeah. they take too many pictures, they take pictures in the dressing room, they take pictures going on stage, they take pictures of their breakfast and, yeah. like, well, yeah. and, and so there's no mystique, you no, no. with musicians you want mystique, when you're a kid, I, right, you know, really. I didn't want a picture, I didn't want to know what David Bowie had for breakfast, I like to think he lived in a spaceship and at moon dust. Yeah. Well, he probably did, to be fair. Yeah, probably did, yeah. As far as I know, he did. But I, I, you don't want all that information. Yeah. You want mythology. Yeah. And I don't think bands... The only band, I think, in the last 20 years who've understood that are the White Stripes. Jack White really understood what, how to manipulate yeah. his own image. And I think very few bands understand that now. Well, I'm not so sure Joy who didn't do it. You talked all No, they didn't. didn't. No, I mean, the first thing I said to them was, what do you want to do for a picture? And they said, stand at a bus stop. <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, that isn't actually going to make a great enemy cover. He said, well, that's what we do. Stand at bus stops, yeah. <laughs> great. There's a, there's a, look, the quote I like to hear about Joy is that I didn't want to take a picture of Ian Curtis having a piss in a bin. Well, exactly, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, you don't want to spoil an apology, do you? And I, I, and I think the fact that there are so few pictures of them helped to build that mythology enormously. Massively, yeah. yeah. They were quite clever at that. I've taken that, that was wrong, Rob's uh, doing, was it? Yeah. A little bit. Well, it was Rob really stopping and being interviewed. You yeah. Know? And then I, I remember the first time I 
when New when they when they, after Ian died and we became New Order, I did a piece with New Order for the Face with Paul Rambali, uh, the writer. And Paul said to me, "Can you meet me at the station? I don't want to go and meet them first because t- I'm terrified of them." Yeah. And I thought that's hilarious. You know? <laughs> How can anyone be terrified of Bernard? <laughs> 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 Even Hunky's not terrified of him, but... No, you know, no, no. Hey, they do the Rock and Roll, they've been nominated for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah, yeah, that'd, that'd be an interesting backstage conversation. Hey, right? they're, ten, they're tenth, though, on the list at the moment. I think so. I don't think they're going to make it. You've got, to, you've got to pay as well, haven't you? You've got to pay to go. Yeah. I can't see Bernard stumping up No, there. not at all. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not. How much? Yeah. Like, I can't remember what it is. It's, it's not cheap. No, I don't know no. that. No, it would take too long for them to work that one out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But getting back to we are there to talk about the foot. Um, because mm. the way you talk about Mark and taking photographs of Mark, he was very, he was similar in interviews as well, wasn't he? I mean, he pissed the interview about, but you'd always end up with a good, <laughs> yeah, bit of writing at the end of it. Yeah, I remember. I mean, Ted Castle wrote a brilliant piece in his book about meeting Mark for the first time, and he said first thing Mark said to him was. Are you a Jew or a Nazi? Was it a Nazi? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, oh my God, you know. Um, so that was his intro to Mark. Yeah, yeah. He'd have been in trouble if he wasn't Jewish, though, wouldn't yeah. he? What would he? How would you answer that? Is, is <laughs> it either or? I know. <laughs> <laughs> so that was probably where the name came And then he met him about ten years later, and he said, I've met you before, haven't I? He said, I can't remember if you're a Jew or a Nazi. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, all, it was all downhill from there. He's got a bit more going for him than that. Mate. Yeah, yeah. So, you took pictures of Rafters with me and, when me and Steve were there, and that was a great place to the photographs, wasn't it? That was Rafters was great because it was very low stage, wasn't yeah. it? And, um, very low ceiling. And weirdly, yeah. there was such a huge photograph of James Cackney on the back wall behind the stage. Was it? Yeah, I remember that. that. Quite, bands quite often put a black cloth on Yeah, yeah, right, OK. But yeah. I do, I think I've still got a picture of maybe Generation X with James Cagney and Leary. Oh, and brilliant. Really Fantastic. Of, yeah? So, but it was a good venue. Yeah, there was, I mean, there was, a, there was a number of sort of iconic places in Manchester. Yeah. Again, there was the, the, the thread running through that they were, all, they were all a bit of a dump, weren't they? I think. Yeah, Rafters was OK, though. Rafters was, was OK. Like, mm. Raf, Rafters was down, there was a nightclub in Manchester called Fagin's, where, which was like proper cabaret club and Rafters was downstairs it was like the diffusion part of of Fagin's really yeah. so you know it's the cheaper end of the market it was, it was, yeah. Like, yeah. And, but it was good I thought I always thought it was quite a good gig that yeah Rafters was quite good but you had to wear a suit and tie to get in it's um, Fagin's yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I only ever went there once that was to see Scott Walker Wow, which and he, you know, when I was like, I went when I was about nineteen. I looked about thirteen when I was right. nineteen, and I had this ill-fitting suit on, but I managed to get in and see Scott Walker. Did you take a picture of him? No, no. I just went to see him, and he was he kind of did this. He, he knew the owner, and he did a, a gig nearly every year at Rafters. Just another, another famously side. cheerful young man, yeah, Scott yeah, Walker, yeah, I believe. Yeah. And it, it was great. So you know that was that was great. But Rafters <coughs> itself was it was a good punk venue and stuff yeah. was on there. Yeah. I mean, at one stage in like nineteen seventy six, seventy seven, there were gigs two or three times a week. Go to Rafters, Electric Circus, and if you could afford it, you could go to Liverpool. Um, yeah. Eric's. Eric's had had yeah. the same gig on Saturday that we had Sunday. Yeah. So you know. So go on. I was going to say the. You did the cover for uh, I'm Curious Orange, didn't you? What's the album called? I can't remember the play. It's called I'm Curious Orange, but there's a different spelling for the yes. album and for the show for right. some unknown reason. That's the only time you did the album cover. Well, you didn't set out to do the album cover. No, I didn't. No, I, I photographed him. I, I was doing I'm Curious Orange for the NMA. And he didn't tell me where to meet him, and nobody met me. And I had to just get. I come from. I've been in San Francisco, and I had to get back from there to Edinburgh. And I was supposed to be met at Heathrow. No one met me there. I just had to pay for myself to get up to Edinburgh. 
I got there, I had no idea where they were rehearsing, whether it was on stage, what I was supposed to do. I had to go in a pub and find a leaflet for the festival and <laughs> find out where they were. And I got there and he said, oh, you fucking found us then. <laughs> <laughs> you're late. Yeah, you're late. Um, and we did all the pictures on stage and set stuff up with him and Michael Clark and they ran through the show and so on. And after we did the setup shots, Mark said, so can I have one of those for the album sleeve? And I said, why would I give you a pitch for the album sleeve when we... I said, if you wanted that, why didn't we just do some extra ones? And he said, because you'd have charged us. <laughs> he said, you can just give us a spare one. <laughs> I said, you don't work like that. I said, if I, if I give you one, you're going to have to pay for it anyway. Yeah. He said, what the fuck for? He said, you've just taken them. <laughs> <laughs> so eventually the record company, you know, I just left it. The record company did it and they, they sorted it out with me. And then when he did that 50,000 four pounds, can't be wrong, he just did that cut out of yeah, the yeah. cover. And I, and I said to him, and he did it on mugs and badges, did the lot, and I and I said, did you did you license that? Because my stuff's licensed through Getty, and he said, no, he said, I just cut it off the picture you gave me. <laughs> Absolutely no idea that you should pay for it because it was a picture of him. Oh, he probably had an idea, oh, yeah, which he yeah. chose to ignore, yeah. Well, yeah. 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 I'm being kind. And then when we, did, <laughs> when we did these pictures in like 2005, six, and around then, um, they were on Sanctuary and Sanctuary paid for them and Sanctuary licensed the use for a year. And I said, but you'll want them for longer than that. And he said, well, if we do, we'll renegotiate. And of course, a year and a day after, well, the day after the license runs out, Mark starts using the pictures, you know, so yeah. they've got to pay again for them. And he just kind of did it willfully, didn't he? Oh, that yeah. Kind of thing, <laughs> always. <laughs> And I just said to him, you know, Mark will do this. This is what he always does. So yeah. why don't you just license them for 10 years and then you don't have to worry about it? Where's the fun in that? No, so, exactly. So it's just to wind you up constantly. Because I was going to ask about that shot, that shot at, when, behind what's now the Greater Manchester. What's it called these days? The, the uh, Exhibition Centre. Yeah. Because uh, yeah. yeah. it was GMEX. It's not been called the GMEX for 15 years. It's <laughs> always. <laughs> I can't remember yeah. what it's Central called. Central Station. Yeah, it was yeah. Central Station originally, because it was, it was kind of abandoned when you yeah, saw it. Yeah, it was, yeah. Because that's, that's, I mean, it's not, there's no coincidence that that's the colour. That's a, an amazing shot, that, isn't it? Well, I like the cobbles and echoing the, 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 the similar pattern on his jersey. Yeah. Not many people can get away with wearing a golf jersey. <laughs> well, uh, to be fair, a lot of people had them. They used to sell them on Grain Lane Market. Yeah. They were like kind of nylon, weren't they? They were, they were very yeah. nylon. Yeah, yeah, they were, yeah. But, but that's, that's, Part of the thing about the Ford, you could. It, it's like you went willfully to look completely untrendy and ends up looking quite iconic, which is yeah. It's quite a trick. Well, a friend, a friend of mine works for Alexander McQueen, and she said to me, "Oh, she said we've got your Ford book on our style shelf." <laughs> <laughs> so, if Alexander McQueen do Jacquard golf jumpers next year, you know where it started. <laughs> he's, he's rocking a great pair of brothel creepers on yeah, that picture. Yeah, yeah. Not Mike Lee, huh? Were they? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. You could wait, Mike Lee was a drummer before me, and yeah. he famously joined the band from a like a Teddy Boy revival, but you know, so what were they got Rockin' Ricky and the Red Stripe? And the Velvet Collar. Well, Rockin' Ricky and the Velvet Collar, <laughs> yeah. But he brought this like chest of yeah. dressing up clothes, basically. That's quite good. Isn't it? Yeah, so I saw them. The first time they played, what you were there as well, obviously. But, uh, they played Bolden Vale, which was in, yeah. Yeah, well, obviously, Bolden, south of Manchester. And he had his dressing up box. So they came out and they uh, they had Mark had them brothel creepers on, and Martin had this beautiful top, you know, them shorty wadding jackets. Mm -hmm. um, beautiful it was. It looked, it looked very well in it, didn't it? Yeah. And they, black, they all had a black cap on, but it, I don't think it lasted long. Mark, Mike's dressing up box. Never, well, 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 he probably took it with him when he was booted out. Yeah, well, yeah. He, he left, Mike. Yeah. He left, yeah. They, were, they weren't playing. They only did 109 gigs in the eight months he was in there. They weren't playing. <laughs> they weren't playing enough. <laughs> <laughs> you, never took, you, never, you never took them. No. 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 He was great, Mike. He, he, he left, left before. Seen... He left before I yeah. kind of knew he'd started. He was the least likely looking fall member. He looked like an off-duty policeman. Yeah, <laughs> we've seen him a bit of the fall. Not that much better. So, did you prefer to 
take the fall in black and white or colour because they, they, they look great in black and white but then when you see like the Curious Orange and then later ones mm. of Mark well that, that, they don't need to talk about that shoe that sort of last one you did but yeah. they did do what they look really good in colour as well don't they yeah I think so I mean I always I mean uh, you don't have a riot of colour but I always felt the um, colour work for them I mean you know Mark it was quite difficult sometimes with Mark because he did have quite a lot of um, spots and coal sores yeah. and various scabs mm. on his face so it was, yeah. it, it was it was a bit they better in black and white didn't they? they better in black and white <laughs> <laughs> to smooth that out in colour it's there for all to see I'm afraid um, there's a photographer Bruce Guild an American photographer who goes in very very close on Facebook and does 60 by 40 prints of them and I'd always thought it'd be quite good to get into photograph mark yeah but it'd probably scare people away it's quite a he's you know it's a real um he uses um, he, he uses a, a kind of special light and film to bring all the flaws out of your face so I think um, might have been too much <laughs> <laughs> because the, the, that picture you did I think, it, I think it, I don't think it's the whole band is it, is it just Michael Laney at the end yeah and he's they're, they're astonishing pictures though so I mean cause, yeah I mean he, by then he wasn't you know he wasn't a young rock star or anything but they're, they're, they're quite sort of kind yeah. of sad in a way yeah. so um, I think so it, he, he kind of again he turned up really late and I, I'd been in Manchester all day waiting for him and he turned up about quarter past seven so I had about half an hour before the last train from Manchester back to London so we had to do it fairly quickly and he kind of and I'd found this wall of, it's a carpet that those pictures against the grey yeah and bluey wall it's um just it's a car park wall in yeah. Salford behind Salford Town Hall and he um just started throwing his head around and kind of lighting the fire. Yeah. But he was moving a lot, you know, and yeah. it was quite interesting. And also because the light was dropping, there's um, a slight blur on some of them, which is really nice. Yeah. Um, but his face was really falling apart then. I, I think because of the kind of almost canvassy background for the shots, he ends up looking like a Francis Bacon painting yeah. or something. He's, it, it's they were quite difficult to work with at first those pictures because yeah. they're he, he, I mean he does look um, very striking on them yeah yeah but uh, he you know I think magazines found them difficult to use right so but well, I thought it looked great it's a mark of him really if you pardon the pun that he wasn't he wasn't well no he you know you thought I mean, we can argue about whether the fall was mark or mark was the fall but his life was in the fall, wasn't it? So if he didn't look yeah. well, then he, he wasn't like, oh, I can't do anything now. No, he's still doing it. How he did his last gigs, you know. Mm. It's, it was his whole life, wasn't it? And it, it was quite a brave thing, I think. I mean, he did a gig up here, didn't he? I think in Islington it was, where he just did it. He sat in the dressing room yeah. for the whole show. But, I mean, yeah, but he, he did the gig, didn't he? Yeah, That's the thing. yeah. I mean, against it's probably great for photos. <laughs> he, he once did. Just, he, I, I hadn't seen them for years. So I went to the Hacienda to see them, and um, and he the whole gig with his back to the audience. Oh, I was at that. Yeah. And he, and he said to me at the end, he said, "Made your job out tonight, didn't <laughs> I?" Yeah. I so, he didn't make yours easy either. No. That was the first gig without paying, wasn't it? Yeah. Is, is that the one you're talking about? Yeah. No, I was it talking. Was, I wasn't talking about being in the band. I was talking about the one where. Every there was about so it, it, I think he did he only sang about a third of the gig and different bit one 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 song was sung from the bloody sound booth. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that? We blocked that out. No, that, that's the gig I'm saying. The, the first gig without Craig. Oh, without Craig? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I think it was. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. It's a, but he was he, 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 you know he kind of just did these things willfully, thinking it was funny. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, it was. And it was like when we were talking earlier about pictures of him and. Eleni, I was doing some close-ups and Eleni said to me, she said, Kevin, what is the point of having great legs if you're going to take pictures that close up? <laughs> <laughs> you're talking about Mark? <laughs> 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 did, you like, did you like photographing in the Hacienda? 
Um, it was a challenge. Yeah, I've got to say, I can imagine. It's it all right when there was no one in there. Yeah. When, it, when there were people in there, you couldn't take pictures. It was so difficult. Yeah. Right, from on, in there, yeah. Yeah, another example of why it was a bad uh, a bit of engineering. Well, yeah, it was never designed as a venue, but the stage was too small. It was only, you know, if you were about yeah. anyone six foot six, their head would have been touching the ceiling of that stage. Yeah, yeah. It's terrible. I know. <laughs> I got wedged one. Well. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it was, it sound, the sound was terrible. Yeah. The bar was where the stage should be, and the stage was where the bar should yeah, be. Yeah. And it, but it looked great when it was. If you took a picture of somebody when it was empty. Yeah, that's right. I know. I used to use it as. If I was photographing a band, I used to use the Hacienda as my studio quite a lot of the time because it was down the road from my own place. But they had all the lighting rigged up all the time, and I'd sometimes do. You know, I shot the birthday party there, and I shot this band Jazz Defectors and various other people. I, I had a bit more space to work in that yeah. so we used to use it in the afternoon when no one was both, uh, you know. And it was always open as well. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Monday night with like three people. Yeah. Freezing. Well, Absolutely. Well, Friday, freezing. Friday night with three people. Yeah. As well. yeah. And, and, until they discovered Acid House, Tony Wilson always used to talk about the Hacienda and how, and he'd have all these great theories about why people had started coming and why it had changed and stuff and Mike Pickering would say no that's all ru rubbish Tony he said it's when we started selling Stella for a quid <laughs> <laughs> that's when people started coming yeah yeah with him. But plus you could always get in because it was the yeah, big. Yeah. Because you know it was quite difficult to get in the clubs in yeah. West, I think. So everybody always seemed to end up at the Hacienda yeah. because it was vast. Wasn't it? It was too big, really. Yeah. Yeah, but it was empty for the first two years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, you there the opening night when Bernard Manning was on? Yeah, terrible, wasn't it? Well, I don't know. He could have said the yeah. most offensive things to about everyone in the room, but you couldn't make out a word he said. Yeah. Tony thought it'd be hilarious opening a club in Manchester and having Bernard Manning on as his opening act. Yeah, yeah. He refused his feet, didn't he? Everybody thinks Tony got everything right, but you know, sometimes he made a real rick, didn't he? Yeah. They? I've played some shitholes in my time. Yeah. He refused his feet. Yeah. Bernard Manning. No, I don't want paying for this shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean... It's astonishing to look at those photographs of the fall and not even if you just look at the background, certainly then ones of the G map, how Manchester has changed. Because we, we did that loud of the words thing, uh, and where the picture of Mark in front of that gas canister or whatever they call, that's where that is now. Yeah, it is, yeah. That hotel is, yeah. yeah. That's how little was going on in Manchester. You could have built one of them gas uh, the city centres right in the middle of the city. It's a massive thing. Yeah. Because there was just nothing there, wasn't there? No, I kind of think it, it was in, it was interesting. It's always interesting when you photograph people um, in urban settings like that, I think, because cities change so rapidly that maybe at the time, you know, the magazine would say, well, you know, that, why, where's the interest there? It's like, I've got a picture of Bernard Sumner walking down the street in New York at 6 a.m. But the cars in the shop helped to date it, and 10 years on, those pictures start to look completely different. Yeah. And it's really important, I think, sometimes, when a band are from um, a major city like that, to yeah. include the city in it, because you get some sense of how they grew up and how they developed, and also how they sounded, why they sounded like they did. Because I don't think... The Fall or Joy Division, um, another maybe a couple of other Manchester bands would have sounded like they did without living in that yeah, yeah. kind of urban set. It's like the picture of Joy Division on the bridge in the snow. Kind of, I always felt it was my responsibility to let people know what a band sounded like because obviously, then you know, unless you went out and bought a record or listened to John Peel and there was a record available, unless you went to the gig, you had no idea what they were like. No, but if you saw that picture, you'd have an idea what Joy Division sounded like, I yeah. think. and I think that was quite important. Um, and I always say, you know, I said it's got so much space in it, it's so bleak. And Bernard says, well, there's no space in our music. I said, but there actually is. It is, yeah. I said, don't even understand your own music. <laughs> <laughs> Martin Alec gave them a lot of yeah, that, yeah, didn't he? Yeah. yeah, they weren't like that live. But they were kind of a bit like heavy metal band when they started. Yeah, they, I, I mean, I think Martin Hannett <laughs> saved them from being Bob Jovi. <laughs> 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 oh, look at that. 
I'm a punky man. You know? I think the punky would have loved to have been bon in Bon Jovi. Yeah, well, but I think, well, maybe mm. more. I think he'd probably say MC5 rather than. I think, bon I, yeah, he might say that, but. <laughs> You were fairly heavy metal, weren't you? He had the air for it then as well, didn't you? Yeah. You were alright. You were alright. Yeah. Bit goth. Monaco. Yeah. <laughs> Monaco were alright as well. Yes, Monaco were as good as electronics. No, oh, okay. all right. No, I don't, probably not. I always thought all the offshoot bands that they did were quite good, but they missed. You know, it's like electronic were really good, but would have probably been improved by Hooky's Bass. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And Revenge were quite good, but would have been improved with Bernard's voice. Yeah. And so they kind of why bother? <laughs> they say, Stop doing all these offshoot things. The other two, you know. Yeah, yeah. The other two would have been all right with the other two. <laughs> <laughs> So they like they've just finished the world's biggest world tour, 15 number ones, and everybody's sick to death of Duran Duran. So they split it half and half, then there's two bleeding bands. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to hear them, you know. No, 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 well, I mean, so I, suppose, I suppose I'm sure a lot of that was it was a more pleasant experience working without each other for a bit. You know, uh, well, like, well, no, it was all right. I kind of like the conflict sometimes. It's well, it's massive, yeah, you know. And they were travelling separately. It's like loads of bands do it anyway, you know. I went, I went on tour with the Colts and Billy Duffy said, which bus do you want to go on? And he said, ours is, the rock, my, ours is the rock and roll bus and his is the, is the pipe and slippers bus. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll have the pipe and slippers bus. Yeah. Thank you, man. <laughs> so they all, they all do it and Hooky and Bernard were travelling separately and I'd say to them, why, why, why aren't you travelling in the bus with the others? And he'd say, I don't want to catch cancer. <laughs> well, so they, all, they all smoked. Ah, right, okay, yeah. So he, he had a limo, he had a stretch limo, and they, they were in a mini bus. I mean, yeah. we, we, used to, we used to be in the back of a transit with, uh, so there'd be Mark and Kate and the driver all lighting up bloody uh, Marlboro's. Uh, and, and it's not a big back of a van. No. I'm sure, you know, you can't have been the healthiest of environments, sure. so was it? Well, I mean, other than the fact that we were sat sitting on cushions on top of the amps, if we'd have had a bit anything, we'd have all been dead. Yeah. Yeah. Health and safety was a... Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't an issue then. No, but no, people no. did. I mean, people... I mean, Everyone like piled, piled into the back of the transit to go to gigs halfway yeah. around the country. Yeah, yeah. yeah. With no no safety at all. No, I mean, no, you no, just no. Sit, Like, say, you're sitting on the equipment. And yeah, we did, yeah, we did a tour of Germany with, a, on, with the band had two benches, one on the other side, and that was well, it. that actually sounds... That, that sounds like... The kind of Mark, Mark would always do that. Yeah. When he played that, what was the place he played in Croydon? The comedy. Was it called Comedy Club or something? Yeah, Cartoon. Cartoon, Cartoon Club. He had the band staying in a guest house in Croydon, two to a room at 22 quid a night for the room. And he, he and Elaine were staying in the Hilton at Gatwick. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, Charming. <laughs> Yeah. Well, we, we one time we did this. We did a tour of. I think I was in a transit van, and we got we broke down on the Friday in this place called Holzkirk. It was a sort of twin with itself, really tiny little German village. And um, we had no money, and we were there. It was a bank holiday on the Monday, so we were there three days, and we had like literally like two quid each a day. But did you not we, give you was that your PDs? Well, we didn't get any PDs. We, we kind of we eat out. We worked it out. We could get a beer. Uh, we if we. If we Go up for breakfast, we could then sneak a bit of bread and ham, and that would be your lunch, and then we had enough for one beer and a bowl of soup in the evening. So we did that for three days, and we found out on the fourth day, Mark had a bloody credit card, he was going to the next village in the bridge, in a taxi, and eating out every night. You thought he was sitting in his room? Oh, we thought he was doing the same. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. There's not a lot to do in all skirts, you know, on a Sunday. Yeah, yeah. I must have seen that War Memorial 15 <laughs> times. <laughs> and I, I think at this point we're going to open up to the floor for questions, yeah. I think. If that's all right with you, Kevin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Where's our roving reporter? Anybody <laughs> got, got a question? There we are. Gen on. Gentlemen here in the Children <laughs> of the Stones. Terrifying. Terrifying TV show, that. I don't know. Um, Question for Kevin, really. Um, the, uh, uh, the photography that you took, the rock photography, was, was amazing. Which other um, 
of your kind of competitors did you did you rate uh, um, of that other era? Did you have any? Uh, uh, and, and what was your relationship with with, with with them, or did you even mix them at all? Don't really like music photography. <laughs> <laughs> I like, I, I mean, I never, I, I, I know I got categorised as that, but I did do other stuff as well. And I wasn't a big fan of music photography. I always thought it was a bit cliched. Um, and I kind of like, when I was studying photography, I studied um, Diane Arbus and Bill Grant and um, August Sander. And I kind of like people who didn't photograph musicians, really. So I don't know. I mean, I like Penny Smith because um, she was one of the first people I met who gave me a bit of encouragement, really. But most people um, saw you as trying to take their work from, you know, if they were working for the NME and you came along and they start thinking, oh, you know, I want to do this, I should be doing this, and there'd be a bit of kind of... Uh, unnecessary rivalry when people could maybe work closer together. Mm. So, uh, you know, I like certain things. I like certain pictures that people have taken, but I can't say, I don't really know enough about it to comment on it because I didn't really look at a lot of that, if that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, so, Jill Fermanovsky, you, you, you knew her as well, I believe, with kind of contemporaries yeah, as well. If, I mean, I could tell you a story about a photo of Jill took, but it's probably not very fair. Tell me when we switch the mic off. Tell me when we switch the mic off. <laughs> and I'll, I'll edit it in without your knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, Kevin, your stories about Mark being late or uncooperative, unhelpful, did you ever complain or get into arguments with him about that? I uh, never argued with him about anything. I mean, uh, you know, my job is to photograph someone when they're ready. You know, it's, it's kind of up to them, really. And so there's no point in causing any conflict over it. So I never did, no. Um, you know, I mean, I've... Much as my friends don't kind of get it, I do have an enormous amount of patience when I'm working with people. And, um, you know, I could do a great book of hotel lobbies I've sat in waiting for people to <laughs> I was turn gonna, I was going to ask, is, is are most bands like that? Then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They kind of turn, you know, it's, like Sean Ryder, I photograph Happy Mondays a lot, and Sean Ryder doesn't even know there's two ten o'clocks in a day. <laughs> um, <laughs> Kind of, you know, I, I sit there and wait for them to turn up, and when they turn up, I mean, I I went to New York once to photograph Duran Duran. It was five days before we got the pictures because we don't, you know, we have an idea. We were also that they were staying in different hotels ostensibly for um, security reasons, but it was because they didn't like each other. So everyone stayed in a different hotel, and we were staying in a really nice hotel, uh, the Royalton in Midtown Manhattan. And we'd meet the manager and say, when are we doing the pictures? And he'd say, well, Simon's not feeling quite up to it today. So we'd say, well, why don't I do a picture of, why don't we just ask him to come down to the lobby of his hotel and I'll photograph him in and around the lobby. And he said, great idea, I'll fax him. <laughs> it's like we all have fucking mobile phones, you know, and he says, oh, I'll fax him. And I said, and PR said, just ring him. And he said, Simon won't do the telephone when he's on tour. He'll get back to us in 24 hours. We said, we're going home tonight. <laughs> and he was up the stairs in the same building. <laughs> <laughs> so we had to reconvene in the lobby 24 hours later, and we got a fax from Simon exactly on 24 hours saying, I don't think I want to leave my room. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> so I said, how about if we photograph him in bed? <laughs> and he said, great idea, I'll fax him. No. <laughs> We got a fax, we're all sitting in the lobby waiting for the fax. We hear it coming through. No. 
<laughs> just had off for five days. <laughs> it's a trick, you know. So you know, that's like, that's <laughs> excessive. Like, if you ever get them together, then the, the, the Well, I took some book. pictures of them backstage on the second gig with the, with the, their girlfriends teasing their hair ready to go on stage. Right. Well, well you, was, uh, they'd have to be backstage, really, wouldn't they? They can't yeah. really avoid that. No, so, <laughs> uh, yeah, we kind of cornered them, really, and got that, and got that. And then, you know, it just got worse, really, so. Yeah. But, I mean, I I've been to New York on the wrong weekend oh, yeah. to photograph Lloyd Cole once and he said to me, oh, I've got a song in that somewhere. I went to see him and he said, oh, what are you doing this week? What are you doing out here this weekend? I said, you. He said, <laughs> he said, I'm not ready for it. He said, I told him that I've been in the studio. He said, I want to get hair caught. I want to get, you know, a bit of sun. I want. Oh, he said, can you come back next week? And I said, yeah, okay. You know, we weren't paying for the flight. No, yeah. and they don't realise they're actually paying for you. It's like yeah. when, when you go on, bands pay for you to go on tour and they don't realise. So when you're on tour with them, you know, and they're saying they've got no money and they say, can we have your mini bar? You say, help yourself. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Take as much as you want. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Do you not think that's gone now? Do you not? Bands are a bit more canny now, aren't yeah, they? They are a bit, yeah. But and and hotels are a bit. Bands are a bit. Well. Well. And oh, I, yeah. I think the that idea of where bands are oblivious to what's best for their publicity machine are gone as well, aren't they? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think so. And, but that's because every because everything's digital and because there isn't as much money on that side as there used to be. I mean, the money was ridiculous. Ridiculous at one stage, yeah. yeah. You know, I could say, oh, I want to go and photograph Morrissey in Japan for the enemy, and they'd say, yeah, great, you know, go. You don't want to do an interview. Well, that's all right. I can write captions for the photos. We could do anything, you know. Yeah. Mm. And we'd just go out for a week and do whatever we wanted. <laughs> bloody nice. But now you can't. No, no, you can't. No, you've no. got to get bloody tubes to Walton Street. You can't tote bags to make your money. Yeah, exactly. Selling tote bags at 20 notes a piece. <laughs> <laughs> You were in it at the right time no, then, weren't you, really? Oh, I was well, there. You, definitely you were definitely right. Yeah, I'm not yeah. sure I'm here at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, bands wasted a lot of money then on it. You, I, I always think well, about people... Re- mainly on their music. Yeah, but, no, but you talk about someone who's paying some ridiculous amount of hours. So you're paying 300 quid an hour to play pool in the next room. Yeah. Why not play pool for a week and end up the bleeding well, they, they wouldn't realise that. And, uh, and especially in... in um, those residential studios yeah. that bands used to go to, they'd get there and they'd think, this is great. They'd spend two weeks, like say, playing pool, and you've got all the technicians and you, 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 you know, your producer, everyone sitting around doing nothing. Mm-hmm. And they don't seem, they didn't seem to realise that they were actually paying yeah. for everyone's time while that was, well, yes. like you say, they were playing pool. Yeah. Have you got any yeah. experience of that, Stephen? I have, we did it, yeah. Cold Selfish, we booked that uh, studio in Glasgow for a month. Nuke a table downstairs, having tournaments and uh, recorded the album and ditched it all. Went in another studio for three days and re-recorded the lot. Lead, you know. But well, I'd turn up at a residential studio and you'd say to them, have you got stuff written? Are you going to start rehearsing it? How are you going to do it? And they said, oh, no, we think we'll just start writing here once we get the vibe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It's all rules, it's five years later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Blimey. Any, anybody else got any other questions before we wrap up? Don't be shy. You want to go again? They all come and ask questions when you sign in the book. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this guy here. The handsome guy with the beard, innit? Yeah. Oh, we got a lot. Here you go. <laughs> uh, question for Paul and Steve. Um, when Briggs joined the band, what difference did that make to Mark and what difference do you think it makes to the Force movie? Can you guys have in the band then, weren't you? Mm. Are you going first? No, you can't. Go on. What different? He was nicer he for was a bit. He was nicer for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he was a bit more polite. He was like, can you please turn them <laughs> monitors up instead yeah. of, turn the fucking monitors up. <laughs> when she first came, she was doing the lights. Yeah. And we played the electric circus, electric circus, electric ballroom. And there's a, obviously there's a tape of it. And it's like, can we just have that light down a little bit? Just a little bit, please. And there's one from like three months earlier. If you turn that fucking light back on, I'll break your neck, you cunt. <laughs> So that's, that's what he changed. 
Didn't last. Hey? Didn't last. Didn't last really, no. But, uh, <coughs> uh, well, that was a difference. I, I don't think that all that about she made us made him into a pop band. I don't think that's quite true. I think maybe production wise, um, certainly having your photograph taken took a bit of a. Well, she also to... taught in the merits of the the uh, domestic refrigerator. She did, she did. Yeah, yeah it's not putting milk on a window. Sale, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah. Steve was there the first time she went in a chip shop and asked for a scallop, <laughs> and was yeah. disgusted to find it was a potato in batter and not. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, like Peter Mandelson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's great. Okay, that I is. Know, that's I don't know if you can stop walking along with you. Yeah. Mushy Yes, sir, madam. Oh, yeah. Just wondered how much of your old sort of gear you still got. Do you keep it for nostalgia reasons or... Or do you still use it, even? And following on from that, even, can you see... You mean clothes? No, camera gear. Equipment. Tools of the trade. Um, and can you see photography going full circle on digital, like sort of vinyl is now ahead of CDs. You know, it's gone full loop, basically. Would it, would it ever happen, do you think? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I think digital's great. I, I mean, digital... Um, is very democratic, isn't it? You know, you see, if I was photographing a band out in the street, no one would take any notice. You've not got a hundred people walking past you trying to take a picture because no one really had a camera. You know, the only time people use their cameras when when it was film, you'd use, uh, you'd take pictures on holiday, you'd finish the film off in the back garden with the dog and send it to the chemist. Whereas now, people take pictures of everything they do. You can't, they're not, you know, everyone's documenting their lives all the time, like a fucking fast bender or something. You know, when are you ever gonna put this film of your life together? I mean, I wanna see it. Um, so I don't see the, I mean, people use film, but if I turn up with a roll of film, a magazine, they'll tell me to go home and digitise it. So there's no point unless you're uh, an art photographer and you're doing something like that. If you're working as an editorial photographer, then you try and shoot. It's like people who write in longhand and submit their copy to a newspaper. They just put it through the shredder and tell them to type it up. Yeah. <laughs> true. Why would you? So I can't see why. I mean, I've, I've still got cameras and stuff, obviously. Um, I use digital, but because you have to. You know, I, it's like going out shooting on 10 by 8 plate cameras and insisting that the magazine will get it in a month. <laughs> That's not kind of how it works, really, unfortunately. Good question, though. Anybody else? Oh, I would like to ask Kevin. Um, obviously, those first shots, you know, you decided to go... Hello, boys. You decided to go and... Yeah, hello there. I recognise that voice. <laughs> you decided to go and photograph the band, right? And that was your choice. Yeah. And then after that, was it always a commission? Or did you ever at any point say, oh, I'd like to catch up with the fool again? Um, it was mainly commission. Occasionally I'd take some pictures if I was somewhere. But, you know, it's kind of... It, it's not... If it was as easy as just being able to be being able to ring someone and say, oh, I've kind of not photographed you for a year, can I do it? Um, no, you have to earn a living from it as well, and so photographing bands free of charge isn't always that easy to do. Um, and they've got to give you time. I mean, sometimes I'd go and sit in, a, in, re, in rehearsal rooms with people just to get some up-to-date pictures. But quite often you've got a PR who they're working with whose job is to stop you doing your job, not to facilitate it. So it's not always that easy. And, and you're talking about a difference between going digital. When did you go digital with the fall? Where did I what, go digital in your photographs for the fall? What period was um, that? Two thousand or so. Okay. Around then. Was that ahead of the curve or behind the curve? Do you think? Was... Well, I I shot a book for Man City in their final season at Main Road in two thousand two, two thousand three, and I deliberately shot it on film because I wanted really it was going to be in colour. I wanted really heavily saturated colours. 
and I wanted it to be like the kind of colour you get when you're seven or eight years old and you live in an inner city and you've never seen a tree or grass before and you walk into the football stadium for the first time and it's the biggest expanse of green you've ever seen and that stays with you and I think that heavily saturated experience it's like Wizard of Oz when it goes from black and white into colour it's an absolutely amazing feeling and I think that's what we wanted to do and I tried about 20 different film stocks to find a film that would work for that. So I shot that on film that whole season and all the other photographers were using digital. And some of them had never shot on film. And they were laughing, you know, they were saying, how do you know you've got a picture? And I said, well, because that's kind of my job. I mean, I've kind of shot a film all my life and so you have that experience. And they didn't get it, they didn't understand it at all because they were there with their laptops and getting a picture immediately and so on and I'd get mine about two days later, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and that's kind of what it was like. And so, but I did have digital cameras then. It's just that I decided I was gonna do a book on film and then leave it. That would probably be the last thing I shot on film. Anybody else? Jimmy Chorin. there. One more question. Well, I'm thinking of Kevin and the football. Yeah. It's on quarter two. They haven't even announced the team yet. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm all right. I'm okay for now. Yeah. So Final question. Final question. Okay. It's a, it's a kind of question in two parts to Kevin. Um, firstly, two did you parts. Ever... <laughs> <laughs> did you want one question? I'm sorry. Did you ever, did you ever, did you ever consider becoming a sports photographer, knowing you're, you're interested in football? And also, you know, do you think there's a difference between being able to enjoy the music as a music photographer, whereas as a sports photographer, you wouldn't probably be able to enjoy the game as much because you're concentrating on... on well, you get something action. different out of it, aren't you? If you're, you know, I wouldn't want to photograph... <laughs> Uh, I mean, I wouldn't want to take pictures from Man City all the time. And also, when I was shooting for City, when I did the book for City, it wasn't just a book of action shots. I was photographing the crowd and the environment that the ground was in and fans in and outside the ground and stuff like that. Also, I mean, I did photograph players at training and did some pictures during the game because obviously that was the focus of people going there for two hours but um i wouldn't i'm i'm i wouldn't want to do i've not been trained to be a sports photographer it looks really difficult um i'm much better off and also you've got to get up really early it was a really difficult year for me that because they're on the training pitch at 10 o'clock in the morning and i I, you know, I don't even get into action till about lunchtime because normally I'm used to, you know, I've always worked with musicians who kind of turn up, if they're doing a studio session with you, they turn up at 10, 11 o'clock at night. So I'm used to kind of working through the, through the night rather than getting up at nine to get on a football pitch for 10 o'clock. I can't really do it. Um, I used to enjoy gigs photographing them live. I don't like, I mean, I'm not a massive fan of taking live photos at, at gigs, but I used to kind of enjoy it because I felt, because I was always at the front, so I always felt part of the action. So it was quite exciting. And also, there is a slight level of uncertainty when you shoot on, on net, on film, because, you know, you're not immediately checking what's on the back of your camera straight away. You know, you co you're concentrating and trying to time it and get the perfect shot. Whereas I think with digital, it's a bit more throwaway. So I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I couldn't do sports photography though. It's like doing ballet, it's really difficult. You've got to get it exactly the right moment or else it's shit. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're going to go on shell. We're going to say thank you. If you put your hands together, take them up. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that brings us unbelievably to the end of series three of Old Brother. Thanks for joining us for this series. Hope you enjoyed us with Trinon. 
big thanks, of course, to all our amazing guests for agreeing to join us here. We're eternally grateful. If the good laws were in the creek, don't rise. We'll be back with a new series pretty soon. In the meantime, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, at Over the Show, where you'll find lists to our Spotify playlists. You can also subscribe via iTunes, Stitcher or RSS. Then you'll be all set for Series 4 when it does arrive. You can also give us a rating on iTunes or subscribe on YouTube or just tell your friends if you fancy it too. For further reading, our books The Bid Midweek and Have a Beating Guess still available from Root Publishers and all good bookshops. I hope to speak to you all again soon. And remember, if you're driving, take your car. Ta-da! Mm-hmm.